Do you find that your visual effects shots are becoming very boring and can basically be rendered as a single non-moving image if you wanted to? Well, in today's video, we're going to be trying to solve that by learning to camera track inside of Blender. Like always, everything that I use is in the video description, so just go down there and download the footage. Uh, we're going to be using this footage today. And next thing that we need to do is go inside of Blender and let's go ahead and get started. Now the first thing that we need to do for camera tracking is to actually go ahead and convert it to a uh, image sequence of some sort. I like to work in PNG sequences uh, for shots that I know I'm going to upload to YouTube. Uh, however, use whatever file type that you prefer. So in order to do that inside of Blender, we're going to come hit this plus icon, go up to video editing, video editing. And then we're just going to go ahead and add and we're going to select movie and go ahead and look at uh, the movie that we did just downloaded. So here it is. You're just going to click that add movie strip. Okay, so there are actually a few things that we want to do before we render this out. First thing is come up here to the render properties, and it should automatically select it. Uh, but if you want to come down to the color management and make sure this is on standard instead of filmic, uh, that is correct uh, color space for video. And then the next thing you want to do is uh, go back up, go to the output section, and make sure our frame rate matches the frame rate of the footage. If you want to see what the frame rate of the footage is, you just want to go inside of your folder, and then you can come over here to your footage, right click it, and then go to properties, details, and then it should say it right here. So Blender should automatically uh, set it, but it's just always good to double check. And so once those two things are good, uh, you can of course set your uh, frame length and everything down here. Uh, since we're just going to be working with the start of the footage, I'm going to leave it at 250 for now. And so uh, all those settings are correct. We're just going to come to the output section. We're going to go to output and we want to save a location for our file. I recommend making its own folder since it's going to be rendered out as many images. So we're just going to come down here. I'm going to name this uh, camera tracking um, tutorial. And then uh, I always like putting a dash at the very end just because it's going to uh, basically output a bunch of numbers as the frames. And so it's nice to just separate that from the main text of the uh, file format and hit accept we're going to come to uh, png is automatically selected since we don't have any alpha in this i'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the rgb uh, on instead of rgba since we don't really need alpha and i was just like uh, changing the compression down to zero percent and then we can just come up here and render the animation okay so now that we have the uh, footage actually rendered out as a image sequence we're going to come up here to file and just start with a new general uh, scene we don't really need to save that and so now we can actually get into the camera tracking part of this tutorial. Um, so what we want to do is come up to the top again, hit the plus icon, go to VFX this time, and motion tracking. And this is kind of just a default uh, scene for motion tracking. I'll explain uh, some of these. This is the dope sheet. It's basically used for keyframes and, uh, and everything. But I don't really use it that much. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and right click here and join the areas uh, over here. So we have our 3D view uh, up here. And then down below is kind of a uh, tracking graph section. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But basically uh, what we want to do is just focus on this middle area. This is where we want to go ahead and open up our image sequence that we just made. So once you find your image sequence, we're just going to go ahead and hit A to select all the frames and then open the clip. And then what we want to go ahead and do is, again, come back up to the render properties, go down to color management, and by default, it's set to filmic. We want to set that to standard. Uh, it doesn't automatically do it this time, so we have to automatically or manually uh, do it ourselves. And then, again, we just want to come over here. Uh, we can work in the 29.97 FPS. Uh, the nice thing and the reason that we do the image sequence is because we're not tied down to frame rate. Uh, basically, whenever we rendered, we're not going to have any issues of uh, exporting the wrong frame rate. Say we uh, do a camera track in 24 FPS by accident, uh, but our footage is in the 29.97. Uh, if we move it between programs, it's going to be a little wonky. Also, uh, sometimes Blender doesn't like certain video formats, and so it's always just a nice uh, rule of thumb to uh, convert your movies to image sequences. Okay, so now we have our uh, scene inside of Blender. Uh, you can see that it's a little choppy down here. You can actually see this bar is uh, the frames that are loaded in, and you can see the blue ones, lighter blue ones, are the frames that are loaded into the sequencer. So what I want to do is go ahead and uh, prefetch the footage. That basically just loads all the frames into our cache, uh, so now we have nice smooth playback. I also want to know uh, if we render it out a longer sequence, we can go ahead and hit the uh, set 
scene frames up here and then i'll basically just set the end frame to be whatever uh the last frame of our footage is but since we did the default 250 we don't really need to hit that now for whatever reason if uh when you hit prefetch all of your frames don't get loaded uh, that's actually to do with the memory cache uh, inside of blender so if we come up here to edit preferences and then we just want to go into system if you come down to the uh the vid video sequencer you can see that we have a uh, memory cache limit uh that's set to about uh four gigs right now uh, i just like doing mine times two uh, now it's gonna basically depend on your gpu and also your ram uh, i believe i have 16 gigs of ram so that's basically half of my ram right there uh, that it's going to allow to put uh, the image images into that ram uh, so then if you hit prefetch again it should load it all the way through and you shouldn't have any choppy video okay so if you are totally new into the blender camera tracking settings uh, the, this uh, over here are the three windows that we need. Annotation, you're never really going to use. It's more so for just like drawing stuff on uh, on here. And you're not really going to use that unless you are talking with a client or something. Up here is the main section that we're going to be using to track the footage. And then after we have tracked the footage, we actually need to get a solve error. And I'll kind of explain that once we get to that. But first, the track window. Uh, if you go ahead and hold control and click at the middle of the screen, uh, you can see that we have a tracking marker and then if uh, we have a, a secret search area if you hold alt s it'll reveal that and basically all this does is the middle box is the area that blender is actually going to try to track and then between the keyframes this bigger box is the area that blender is going to search for for that exact track in the middle so say if we go to the next frame uh, blender is going to look in this whole region to determine where this box is for the next frame so let's say it moved like right here um, then blender is going to uh, like search in there and pick that out automatically one very important thing to uh, camera tracking is knowing what size you want both of these boxes. Now you can uh, either uh, control click and then ch uh, choose the size of the bo boxes by themselves. Or what's nice is you can actually come over here to the pattern size. And the pattern size is the middle box and the search size of course is the outside box. And then if you change those, it'll change out here. Uh, I'm just going to uh, undo what I did and keep them on the default values for now. We can always change them later. Um, let's go ahead and delete this one. But basically, a good rule of thumb is knowing uh, your size of the scene and what points you want to track. You want to try to look for points that uh, have very high contrast. I actually chose this uh, video because it's a very easily uh, trackable scene. We have nice floor plane. We have nice parallax. We have a lot of detail and all these bricks and everything. Uh, so a good point, for instance, would be this little point right here. We can tell that it has a lot of contrast from the ground. And it's going to be very easy for Blender to automatically track that throughout the scene so you'll notice that the box right here is actually a pretty good size for uh these type of smaller details so i'm not really going to mess around with the pattern size and uh the search size is where you get into a lot of trouble sometimes and since this is such a slow moving camera track uh then we don't really need to adjust the search size i think it's big enough but if the camera was moving faster uh you might lose some track sometimes because say in one frame uh, the search size is here and then the next frame over you go and now it's here You'll notice that our black little dot isn't in our search area anymore So blender is going to lose that track and so all you have to do in order to uh, Correct that is to actually bring this and make it a little bit bigger say like there And now if that was the next frame over then blender would be able to track and be able to pinpoint that to there And so the only thing that you have to know is that the bigger you make the search size uh, the more errors you could have say our search size was this big maybe blender would be like oh is that the uh the tracker that we are looking for since they look so similar but also uh the amount of time it takes to process that if you have a uh you know hundreds of trackers it's going to take a long time for blender to actually calculate so you want to try to keep it as low as possible that you need and since we're dealing with a very slow moving scene we don't need to change these uh but that's kind of the basic explanation for those uh pattern size and search size next over here is the motion model uh now i prefer for the way i like to track i never really move away from location uh but there are some nice things if you're doing a more uh, complicated track where you need to actually manually set some stuff uh perspective is a nice one because you can basically say i want to uh 
make this you know cube on the side and track this uh, what it will do is actually go ahead and track um, and basically try to move it based on perspective and uh, everything uh, I haven't used this in a long time so maybe try that out uh, give it a little test but for our purposes we're gonna go ahead and keep that on location for this video um, now the match, I always find that the previous frame uh, works better than keyframe. I don't really know the explanation there, just with testing that's always worked out for me. And then this normalize button, basically that's just going to take all the luminance values uh, of the scene. So like the luminance up here and trying to match it to the luminance here and everything. So if you have like changing lights, like flashing lights or, you know, uh, maybe exposure changes or anything, uh, Blender will try to basically neutralize those uh, so it doesn't affect the track. It doesn't have any errors to do with that. The only other setting that you really have to focus on in this window over here is the tra tracking settings extra. Uh, and so we're going to set the correlation to be a 0.9. The correlation basically means uh, what Blender's threshold is to keep a track tracking. So 0.9 basically means 90% of uh, the track is correct uh, for Blender to continue tracking the dot. So if you're tracking a scene and Blender uh, gets to a really fast motion area and uh, Blender is like, hey, I'm not so sure about this frame. Uh, I We think that it's like th maybe 30% correct. Uh, then Blender will actually stop tracking at that moment. So setting it to 90 basically means that Blender has to be 90% sure that this track is correct for it to continue going. And since we're doing so many trackers, this is uh, really doesn't uh, matter. Uh, setting it this high because we're going to lose a bunch, but we're also going to have a bunch more to go off of. Bl Blender basically needs eight uh, consecutive tracks uh, to track a scene. However, I like to have much, much more uh, just so Blender has all the information it needs to uh, be able to track a scene correctly. So the only other thing I want to call our attention to is uh, this side now. Uh, you'll see a couple uh, things over here. Uh, stabilization we'll want, we won't worry about, but footage, uh, if you have a different color space, you want to put that there, uh, but I'm just going to leave it on sRGB. And then uh, the most important section, if you actually uh, have your own footage or if you know any of the camera specs that you're using, uh, you can actually come over here. Say you know the focal length, which is a very important thing, and I highly recommend if you are filming your own footage to go ahead and uh, write all that information down, including the uh, sensor width and the focal length and all that stuff. Uh, go ahead and write that down, and if you do this, uh, you can go ahead and plug the information in here. But since this is a clip from online I, that I don't really know any of the data, we're just going to leave that. Uh, and I press N to uh, hide and unhide that uh, window in case you don't see it. Okay, so now that we know the basic window layout of the uh, tracking windows, uh, we can go ahead and brute force our way into the camera tracking. Now, the method I uh, like to use is basically throwing a ton of trackers at the scene, seeing what sticks, and then uh, just solving out all the ones that have uh, very low or high errors. Um, so what we want to do is come over to the detect features, and we're going to click that. And then we're going to come over here. Uh, we want the threshold to be a 0.01. And then the distance to be an 80. Um, I find that this works the best for the most amount of scenes. Uh, you can, of course, play with the numbers. But all we're really looking for is to just get as many tracking markers as possible in our scene. Uh, this is actually a very nice scene if I come out over here. Hide this. Because uh, you can see that we have a lot of depth uh, here, but we also have a lot of detail in the houses. Uh, what you want to look for is a lot of, uh, you know, depth from the camera. So you want to have stuff kind of in the foreground and stuff in the background. And the most important thing, in my opinion, is actually having a ground plane. And so you can see that we have a lot of the ground exposed here. And so that makes it really easy to pinpoint where our ground plane is. And that will come into later. Uh, but whenever you're picking out scenes, you want to have a lot of depth and a lot of variety in uh, the type of environment that you have. Uh, just because if it was a blank wall, uh, then there's not a lot of detail there for Blender to actually go ahead and camera track and um, you know track all these markers around. So let's hit all H on, hide everything. So now that we have all of our markers in our scene, we can go ahead and hit uh, Control T 
or you can come down here and press I believe this button this tracks them forward so let's just hit control T and let the uh, ones go now you can see that there are some red boxes down here and those are actually uh, trackers that blender has basically stopped tracking and has lost the data for and the reason that uh, these are being lost is because they're going out of screen so that totally makes sense uh, so we don't have to worry about those. So now we have uh, a set of trackers going forward in our clip. I actually like to come to the very end of our clip, so frame 250. And then again, we can hit detect features. It should automatically keep our settings, so that is uh, okay right there. Then we're going to hit uh, Control shift t or again, you can hit this button right here to track backwards. And basically... That's going to allow us to have uh, trackers uh, from the very furthest away we are from the camera uh, to the objects, and then uh, the very closest we are to the objects from the camera. And so that way we kind of have, uh, you know, two sets of things. You can see that they're kind of doubling up here uh, sometimes, and so you, you'll have that. That's totally fine. Blender might honestly delete one of the ones that they don't like. And so the only other thing that I like to do is to come to the middle of the footage. Uh, so 142, well, let's remember that number. So 142, I'm going to detect features again so we can see all this data. And then Control T, that'll track it forward. Uh, so now we're basically doing the midsection. So we have sets of markers where the camera is closest to the objects, furthest away from the objects, and kind of a middle ground. So uh, now that that's finished towards the end, we're going to come back to 142, and then we're going to hit Control shift t to track those backwards. And so now we basically have three sets of tracking markers uh, in the uh, beginning, middle, and end of our clip. And that should give us a wide range of markers for Blender to choose from and actually give us a solve. So without solving the camera, uh, it, Blender does nothing with these tracks. These tracks mean nothing to Blender until we actually uh, make Blender calculate where the tracks are in the scene based on how much they move and the parallax and everything. You can see these uh, blue lines down here. The closer we are to the camera, the faster those uh, blue lines are going to move uh, because of parallax again. And the further away we are, you can see up here, like the trees down here have way uh, shorter lines because they don't move as much. And so Blender is going to take all this information and actually give us a uh, 3D scene based on all of that. So let's come over here to the solve section. Uh, now, if you are shooting on a tripod and you're just like panning and tilting the camera, you can select that and that'll block out all this stuff. Uh, but since we are actually moving within the 3D space in this shot, uh, which is what you're going to be doing most of the time with camera tracking, we actually go need to go ahead and set a A and B keyframe. Now, a, a and B keyframe is basically just a range that Blender uses to determine the solve and determine our scene. Uh, all you need to know is that the range that we pick uh, needs to be the range with the most parallax. And so uh, I like manually solving uh, for those A and B keyframes. However, you can, of course, hit the keyframe button if you want to let Blender solve it. I like having that control uh, because I find that Blender sometimes picks a range that isn't really the best. And so I like to uh, kind of come throughout my scene. I'm looking for, again, the most parallax. I notice that we move very fast with the camera around this section. So I'm going to say like 140 like 240 right here. It's nice to have uh, a long range because uh, Blender will actually use that uh, to average the solve. And so if you have a shorter range, like a five frame range uh, for your A and B K frames, it's going to be really hard for Blender to give you an accurate solve because uh, that's a very short uh, portion of your video. You want to, I recommend uh, no less than 50 frames uh, for your A and B keyframe. Uh, so right now I have a hundred uh, that should give us a lot of room for Blender to calculate and solve for that. Um, so now uh, we need to refine our focal length, optical center, and radial distortion. Basically, these are things that uh, if you do set over here, if you know, uh, say, your focal length and stuff, you want to uncheck that because you don't want Blender to try to guess it. But since, again, we don't know any of that information, we're going to go ahead and try to get Blender to refine that and give us uh, what it guesstimates uh, its uh, focal length and everything is so finally let's go ahead and solve the camera motion and this is going to take a little bit basically again uh, what solving the camera motion is uh, is basically a bender 
Blender taking all the movement of all of our tracking markers and then combining that and seeing how far away that point is from the camera based on how it moves in relation to the other points. So again, the uh, points that move uh, faster uh, are definitely closer to our image because uh, that means that it's moving with more parallax and uh, in relation to the ones in the background are moving with less, less parallax, so they must be in the uh, background. Um, it's very confusing, but it makes sense if you think of it uh, through logically like a computer does. Okay, so uh, once you see that this uh, little bar has gone away, uh, you have gotten a solve. The solve error is right here. So we got a 0.35. Now that is actually a really, really, really good solve error. Um, I try to remain, if I'm doing uh, stuff uh, very legit and I need a really, really good camera track, I try to get that below a 0.1. Uh, basically, all that means is that um, there is some deviation. Uh, it's based on per pixel. So right now, a 0.35 solve error basically means that there might be movement of the scene uh, within one, uh, basically 0.35 of a pixel. So if we put, place an object down, it might move around uh, 0.35 of a pixel. Uh, and you might think that's pretty good, but if you're trying to get a really good solve error um, and really good track, you might be able to see it um, on a big screen. And so what we want to do is uh, below a 0.2 is really good. Below a 0.1 is where we want to try to hit. So let's go ahead and clean some of this up. Now, Blender, uh, you can uh, come down here actually to the, uh, the graph scene now. And uh, since this is such a straightforward scene, you're not going to see anything uh, like crazy happen. But let's say you do another scene and, you know, this point moves a lot. You can see that our graph now has updated. And we basically have one point now that, like, is going haywire. And so uh, when you're camera tracking your own footage, you want to look for those outliers. You know, I can see that this is a huge outlier. All you want to do is just select it, delete it, uh, kind of do a manual pass over what you're uh, looking at. But since I didn't really see any outliers, all of them look to be following roughly within the same kind of zone. Um, so I don't see any for my scene. So we're just going to keep that all Um like un unmessed with and everything again you want to do a manual pass uh for this uh to get all the human error out uh and then after that blender can automatically do it by itself um so now we want to come to the cleanup section over here and we're going to clean the tracks cleaning the tracks is just going to find the biggest thing with the reprojection error or the track frames i don't really mess with the track frames uh since i don't find that they really help with solve error uh, the reprojection error, though, if I turn this up, it's going to find uh, basically use this number that we set as a threshold for the amount of error uh, that each track has. So right now I'm looking for tracks that have a higher error than a 0.47. And so it's automatically selected it up here for us. I'm just going to go ahead and hit delete delete those tracks and so now uh those have deleted the highest uh error track so now what we can do is we're going to come back over here i like to uncheck the uh refinements because every, every, we don't need to refine it every single time blender has auto automatically uh select selected the uh numbers that it thought and so we don't need it to keep uh every single time calculating that since it's most of the time going to be the same number. Uh, so it's just wasting uh, Blender's resources. So uh, after we have that, we're just going to uh, solve that again. And this time with a new solve uh, with less trackers that are uh, this high solve error, we should get in theory an average of a lower solve error. Uh, that is the thing about the, uh, the solve error. It's an average of all the uh, tracker errors. So the solve error up top, the 0.2, there are probably trackers that are 0.4 right now, but there are also trackers that are probably like closer to zero. So it'll average out and give us the uh, the 0.2. And so you can see that's automatically, uh, you know, fixed a lot of our error. Um, one thing to know also is if you're getting any red in this blue bar, that actually means that Blender doesn't have enough trackers to uh, solve during that area. Uh, so you'll need to add more uh, trackers during that area um, and make sure you have, you know, at least, again, at least eight uh, tracks throughout your footage for Blender to be able to track it. 
Um, so now that we have that, we just need to clean it up again. I'm going to try to get this below a 0.1. Uh, so now all we need to do is again clean the tracks. And we're going to put it, you know, maybe to right there. Um, the reason I'm not doing uh, the uh, solve error to uh, 0.1 to begin with is uh, because that would delete a lot of tracks at once. I actually find that if you just skim off the top every single time that you solve, it's actually going to continuously give uh, better tracking for some of the markers. And so if you, you know, go from right off the bat to do a low solve error, then you're actually going to delete some good markers uh, in the bunch, and you don't want to do that. So now that we're pretty low, I'm just going to do, let's say, a 1.5 uh, and delete all those. The reason I can delete that many at one time is because we still have so many tracking markers in the scene. Uh, you also want to make sure you're not deleting tracking markers that are in good areas. So I noticed that uh, a lot of the tracker markers that we selected are in like the shadow, in this like kind of convoluted mess down here. Uh, so they might be bouncing around a little bit, uh, some on the floor, and just some in areas that we already have tracker markers around. So it's not, you know, necessarily a bad thing about losing them. So uh, I want to go ahead and delete those and let's solve it one more time. Now, the one thing that you want to look for if you're manually placing ca camera trackers or if you're letting Blender pick them is that you want to have camera trackers kind of within the foreground uh, Z depth of your camera. So like we have some right here and then some way in the background. Um, that just helps Blender have a variety of uh, marks to track and leads to a better solve error. Let's uh, clean the tracks one more time. Just select a few here we can start to see that we're getting to the threshold where it's like a lot of them are so we're never going to really pass that threshold um so let's solve it one more time and hopefully we can get below a 0 0.1 with this uh no so a 0 0.11 is still really good that that's you know one tenth of a pixel so uh this is where i'm gonna leave it just gonna go ahead and save the project Okay, so now we have uh, finally finished camera tracking. Now we actually need to set up our uh, 3D scene. If you come up here now uh, to the part up here that we uh, left up here, you can see that we don't really have anything set up. It's still our default scene. So what we need to do is scroll down in the solve window and then you'll have the scene set up here. Uh, now we can set the background. That'll set the background to our camera and then the setup tracking scene That'll do a bunch of stuff, but we won't have to worry about that for now. Uh, right now, you can see that we basically don't have our uh, scene actually 3D tracked. We have all the points here that are roughly following, you know, the building and the ground. But uh, it's not actually orientated into our scene correctly. Our cube is kind of just floating there. And so what we need to do is to go ahead and set up some rules of our scene. So the first thing I always do is set up the floor of our scene. Now this is a little finicky sometimes, so you want to try a lot of different points. So I'm going to select uh, Blender just needs three points on the floor plane. So we're going to select uh, these three. Uh, you want to try to keep it in like a right angle triangle that would be on the ground. It doesn't need to, but Blender uh, has a much better time f figuring out the floor plane if it is a kind of right angle triangle. Uh, so this is, if you imagine just a triangle on the ground, this is kind of right angle. This would be, this would basically make a 90 degree uh, thing. Let me actually draw that so you can see. So yeah, so basically... Here are our three points. You can see that right here, it's basically making a 90 degree triangle. Uh, so that's what we want. Uh, and then let's come back over. So now that we have our three points, we can go to the floor. And uh, that's basically set our floor. And you can see that that's actually done a really good job. Uh, so that actually might be our floor plane. But for if any reason your floor plane isn't looking correct, um, then you can select, of course, like three more points, you know, and try that instead. But I find that the first one was actually really good. And so now what we want to do is try to get our basic, uh, you know, rotation of, of our scene. I want to try to make this building in uh, the 3D space. So what I'm going to do is set this point to be our origin. And then we need a reference point to be our axis. So I'm going to select this one. This is roughly in line with the building and stuff. We can, we're can we going to change it later. So uh, we can just set that to be our x-axis for now. And that's roughly followed it. Uh, not the best. 
So I might honestly like select this, select X axis, and you can play around by selecting some different points. Uh, but that's good enough for what we need it for. Um, so now we just need to set the scale of the scene. Uh, now you can get really exact um, with the setting the scale. Uh, but really, I just like to set the scale up until we get like something like that, something where the box isn't too big, but also not too small. And so now that we have that, that is pretty much our scene set up. Uh, if we actually come up in here, we can see uh, we have all these tracking dots um, that roughly follow the shape of the building. You know, you have the building here. And so that's being correctly tracked. And then you have a bunch of the trees back there. And then, of course, the ground stuff right here. And so Blender's actually done a really good job. And that's some thanks to the low solve error. So that's why you always want to have a solve error. So that is our scene uh, correctly set up. Let's uh, now we are actually done with the motion tracking uh, side of things. So we can come out to the layout section. And then let's just go into the camera. Now you can see that a lot of our information is gone. And if you want to set up the uh, scene as it was in the motion tracking settings, you can actually come up here and then go to motion tracking. Uh, just select that on. And then what I actually like to do is come down here and the plane axis, I'm just going to change down the size of it. Uh, so it's not as big yet. We can still tell what the, where the points are. So that's looking good. Now, when we set up the tracking scene inside of Blender, it added a lot of stuff that really I don't like that Blender does. And so what I'm going to do is come up here and undo a lot of the stuff that it made. So it made a uh, couple uh, collections. So I'm going to go ahead and just delete both the foreground and background cr collection. And I also made a background view layer. We're not really going to use that, so I'm going to delete that. Uh, if you do need to use it, then you can always make it yourself. Uh, I just don't like that Blender automatically assumes I'm going to need it. And so in the compositing section, we also need to delete uh, some of these nodes. Uh, these nodes are really meant for compositing um, and matching the scene to Blender. Um, I find if you're going to put all that stuff, all that work in, you'd much rather do it in another uh, compositing software. And so now this is, this is what the compositing uh, side should look like. Now if we go back out to Layout... Um, you can see that everything is set up correctly how we want it uh, to start a new scene. So a couple things that we can do in order to test our footage. Now that we have our camera tracked uh, and have our scene set up and everything is looking good, we really want to make sure that uh, the camera track is good uh, right now before we do any of the 3D work. So what I like to do is select uh, this little cube here. And then let's go into edit mode by hitting tab. Let me actually uh, turn on the shortcuts for you guys. Uh, shortcuts are down here. And so again, go into edit mode by hitting tab. Uh, we can hit G, then we want to move it on the Z axis. So hit Z and then hold control and snap that up one unit. Uh, we do that because now the origin point, this little dot right here is on the bottom. And so if we scale that up and down, it'll always be on the ground plane. That is a very, very important thing for camera tracking. This little floor it made, uh, you can see is on the very ground plane of Blender. Uh, so that is zero on the Z. Um, you can see right over here. If we move it above and down, basically that means that the uh, if we move it above, now the ground is going to be floating in midair uh, if we render it out. And then the same thing, if we do it below, it's going to look like it's basically floating underground, rendered weird or whatever. We want to make sure whatever we do is on the ground plane. So that's why we actually had to move our little cube uh, here so it's resting on the ground plane. Uh, so now if we come over here, hit H to hide that. Uh, I like to do a little test, uh, so let's actually select the cube, and we want to find a point on the ground that's very noticeable and will give us like very good location data. So I notice this little white uh, little dot right here. What I want to do is G, X, I want to move that uh, cube to basically be touching uh, right there on the side. And so now if we go ahead and play our footage, uh, we're looking to make sure that our cube stays with that dot on the edge, with uh, which it's roughly following right now. It, it's not the best. Again, if I was actually doing this for a real uh, scene, I would maybe mess around with the tracking a little bit more. But you can see, for the most part, it's sticking very, very well uh, to that. That means that we have correctly camera tracked it. Uh, you can also try that on different parts of uh, the background and stuff. Let's select like that point right there. 
and uh, how I'm moving this is just G and then you hit shift Z to move on every axis besides the Z axis and then play that you could see it's sticking to that white part really really well so that's just a really good test that you can do uh, the other tests you know of course you see all these dots and you can see that they roughly follow around the ground plane and so uh, that's also looking good now uh, let's actually go a step further and say we want to model out this uh, building uh, you know to act as a shadow catcher or reflection object or you know whatever um, let's go ahead and you know set that up so if I go ahead and select the cube, you know, say I want to position it like right there, um, you know, size it up in the Z. You, you can see it follows it roughly pretty well. Like it's actually like pretty solid, um, but it, it might not be exact for you depending on how you did your scene. So let's just undo that. Um, so what we can do is we can actually go ahead and move the camera after the fact uh, Now if you move the camera after the fact, it's not really going to stay uh, It's going to be a little bit wonky and everything So if you want to move everything that you've created uh, into um, You know at the same time say I want the edge of this house if I go to seven edge of this house to kind of be on here what I like to do to not mess with the camera at all, I don't want to mess with any of the camera properties in case I have to undo what I did. I want to go ahead and uh, shift A, add a empty. We'll just do a plain axis right there. And so that makes it empty in the middle of the same. And then uh, you can either parent every single object uh, to the empty or what I like to do is just the camera. So we just select the camera and then make sure that the empty is uh, the thing that's in yellow up here. And then, uh, so control P is to parent, and we just want to do object. And so now what that's done is if we just select the empty up here, we can move around the empty, and let's say I do something wrong, and, you know, I've messed up my entire scene, I can just delete the empty, and now we're back at square one. We haven't messed with the camera at all. It's all good. But uh, now let's actually try to get the edge of that house, like I said, on this kind of uh, line in the origin. And so, uh, again, just with the empty selected, we can uh, move around these objects. And we're just ju basically trying to line up these tracking markers. It's not going to be perfect um, unless you have an amazing track. But we do want to just line those up uh, to match as closely as possible. And so now we have um, a pretty good distinction of where, you know, the edge of the house is. So let's just come up here to the top view again. Gee, I'm just going to move my cube right there. And so since we have the markers right there, we know that the edge of the house is roughly in this area. And that basically lines up uh, with the camera now. I might need to move it over just a little bit like there. But if we come back out, you can see that that still is like roughly on the same area uh, where our lines are. And so now uh, with that defined, if we move it throughout, you can see that it sticks pretty good to the uh, to the edge of the house. We can actually go a step further and go into edit mode and just go ahead and select uh, some of these and move them where they should be. So again, uh, just tab, I'm just G, and then moving these uh, on some axes. And you can see that's stuck to our house really well. Really well. It kind of loses it a little bit over here, um, which you can definitely, you know, change your camera track or, you know, do whatever you need to. Or you could just fake it um, a little bit. Uh, which is always, you know, something that us VFX artists are doing. But you can see that now with that, that roughly follows the same shape of the house. And we got that information from free, uh, for free, basically, just by having a good track and everything. Uh, the only other thing that I want to kind of call attention to, let's go ahead and delete this. So the ground plane, if we go ahead and go into cycles, going to put on GPU compute. The ground plane by default is set to be a shadow capture object, which is most likely what you're going to be using. If you want to change that off for any reason, if you come over to the object properties and to the visibility, uh, you have to be on cycles, by the way. Um, you'll see that there's this mask shadow capture, and uh, that's actually really nice. Say we have, you know, a nice little scene. Uh, we'll add like a sunlight here going over there. 
Uh, and then we want like this cube here. I'm just going to shift that up to be on our ground plane. Okay, so we have this nice little scene here. This is basically how you do uh, visual effects. Um, we do need to enable the film transparency. And so now you can see with everything that we've set up, uh, with our camera tracking, with our ground plane, with our uh, setting up the camera or the, the scene and everything, you can see that it's giving us a shadow catcher object. We have our main object here. Um, if we go and go ahead and render out a image, uh, what we did in compositing actually translates um, to what we did. Let me actually come up here. Um, so you can see that that has basically rendered out that. And then our movie clip is being applied over top of that. And so that's basically uh, the gist of camera tracking. Uh, now there is one more thing I want to go over. Let me actually load up another scene to show you that. Okay, so here's an entirely new scene that I actually recently did uh, for a video. And the problem I had was I had all these points. I had a solve error that was, you know, pretty respectable at a two, uh, point two four, And so everything was all right, but uh, I couldn't really have any points on the ground. Um, like, you can see there's, like, no data here. I was basically just having, like, to make the floor the ceiling. And so what you can do in a circumstance like this, where you don't really have any points on the floor, but you have a really good solve error and everything else is working out, uh, what you can actually do is add a few manual trackers for uh, like five or 10 frames or whatever, and then uh, use those as the floor plane. So in this example, let's uh, come down here and you can see that we actually have like some uh, things that could be trackable on the floor. So what I'm gonna do is uh, manually add some of those tracks. So it doesn't matter where, I'm just gonna add like here, here, and here, you know, for instance. Let's just uh, take all these three, and then I'm just going to track it forward by hitting this a few times. Okay, so now we can see that we have, you know, like a 10 frame range where uh, it's tracked, like there. You don't have to do it throughout the whole clip. Uh, so now that that's there and they're on the floor, what we can do is go ahead and solve the camera motion again. And uh, we didn't change our solve error. Our solve error is still the 0.24, uh, which is very important. You don't want to increase your solve error with this. Uh, but now that we have these three points, what we can do is set that to be our floor plane. And since we have a good solve error, we have everything correct, uh, that's actually put a new floor plane into our uh, footage. And so that's kind of just like a hacky method uh, to, you know, define the floor plane if you don't have any points uh, to define it for you. So again, let's just come down here and set origin, set X axis, and let's set the scale uh, like that. So you can see that that has uh, followed our floor plane. If I just hide this, you can see it's done a pretty good job. It's a little bit uh, wonky right now. So you might have to, you know, deal with it a little bit. But um, that has, you know, gotten us very far into establishing our floor plane. And so that is just kind of like a hacky method you can use to establish a floor plane. So that is the full workflow and methods that I use to make my own camera track shots inside of Blender. I use uh, this method for pretty much every single one of my visual effects shots and they have never really failed me. Um, there is a lot of tinkering you have to do with it sometimes, a lot of uh, brute forcing of detecting the trackers. Uh, but as you can see with these shots on screen now, uh, you can get amazingly uh, simple tracking results uh, with this method inside of Blender. Blender. Now, hopefully you guys enjoyed this and uh, let me know if there are any other tips or tricks that you have found with your own camera tracking uh, that you would like to share. I'd love to hear them and uh, grow this community together alongside you guys. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to catch you in the next video. Peace.